Well, good morning. Welcome to the church at Avenue South. Uh, my name is Ronnie. It's so good to see you all here today. I don't know if you were like me. I was stuck in my home all week. I love my kids, but I'm so happy to see other people. So thanks for being here, and thanks for joining us online. Uh, if you would, stand with us, and we're going to worship. But he brought me in with love for me Oh, his love for me Who oh, the sun sets free Who oh, is free
Good morning, Church at Avenue South. For those of you that I've not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Matthew Page. I'm the Missions and Connection Minister here. I just want to say how grateful we are that you chose to worship with us this morning, whether you're here in the room or you are joining us online. I want to invite you to continue worshiping through the giving of your tithes and your offerings. And we want you to know that when you give, your giving is making a difference locally, nationally, and globally. Whether you give online, whether you give here in the room at our giving stations, whether you give by mail or you text the word GIVE to 623-623, your giving is helping introduce people to the person of Jesus Christ. Over the last seven months, a portion of your giving has been used to help fund one of our great ministry partners, Salom Health. Salom Health is located here in Berry Hill. They're just right up the road from here in Gale Lane. Salom Health is the front door for every international uh, that, that comes to Nashville. And recently, they launched a second clinic, a satellite clinic, in the 37031 zip code that's in that Nolensville Antioch corridor. And listen to this. Because of your giving, they were able to launch this clinic much earlier than they thought in June of last year. Your giving helped men and women get in front of doctors. They've been able to receive vaccines for the COVID-19 virus. And many of these men and women do not have the resources or the means to afford health care. And your giving made that possible. Not only do they not have the resources to afford health care, but they did not even have the means to get over here to their main clinic right here off of Gale Lane. So over seven months, the last seven months, they have seen 1,500 patients. 1,500 patients have been able to see a doctor, a nurse, get the treatment they have desperately needed because of your giving. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for continuing to, to give in the midst of a pandemic. I know many of you have lost jobs and, and income. And so we are sensitive and mindful of that. And I just, it goes without saying again how grateful we are for your generosity. Would you pray with us? Jesus, I'm thankful for the men and women in this room. Uh, God, I know they gave up something to be here this morning. So I pray that you would give and return that back to them. God, thank you for their generosity. I know I say that every week. But God, I, I am truly grateful to serve such a generous congregation and a church. God, as we'll see in, in the text this morning, that, a, that a, the mark of a Christ follower is generosity. And God, we want to be a church that is not only known for their love, for the gospel, but for being a generous church. God, and I want our people to know that when they give, it is introducing people to you. The only person has the power to change lives, to provide hope and joy. God, we pray now that we would uh, we'd receive these tithes and offerings, be good stewards of them. We give them back to you to be used for the kingdom. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys stand with us as Larissa leads.
of self-sufficiency and competency, um, we do not have to be self-sufficient or competent. Um, in fact, we cannot be. Um, and I'm so thankful for that, that the Lord um, asks us to need him, that we do need the Lord and that he provides for us in that. And we're also not to walk, not meant to walk alone in our own journeys. We have um, fellow believers and brothers and sisters in Christ to walk with us um, and to carry our burdens with us. So let's praise him together in this song that we need him and that he provides for us and wants us to need him.
guys can have a seat. Good morning, church family. If we have not had a chance to meet, my name is Aaron, and whether you're in the room or online joining us because of the weather or because of the world that we still live in with the pandemic, I want to welcome you here, and I would love to lead us into a time of prayer. You know, in the book of Acts, the first church, which is what all other churches should and gain confidence by modeling what we do when we gather comes from. You know, one of the things the early church did is they sung songs. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. That's one of the reasons we do it. But we also pray together. And sometimes that's a brief prayer. And this morning it's going to be a little more extended. And so I want to lead us into that time because that's an act of worship. And, you know, when I look back at my journal and what I wrote down about six years ago when we planted this congregation. I wrote down, I, I don't want to be part of something that, that is just God-honoring, engaging services and ministry on a Sunday morning. And then all we look forward to is coming back six days later to Sunday mornings. I, I, I want us to be part of a movement of God that is a church, that is a family that cares for one another, cheers loudly for one another, supports one another, and especially when people are going through difficult times that, that supports one another, that grieves for one another. And we have a family in our congregation that is going through a difficult valley right now, and it is very important for us to intercede on their behalf. Now, some of you may be aware that this past week, a, a sweet and precious godly family in our congregation, the Martins, Jake and Daphne, unexpectedly lost their nine-year-old son, Campbell. Okay, one of the most important reasons that I'm telling you this is so that we can be faithful to pray for them. Interceding for someone is when we go to Jesus and say, I, I, I don't even have the words. And maybe you feel like, I, I wouldn't even know what to do with that information or how to help. There's practical and tangible ways that we are going to be committed as a church staff and congregation to walk with that family forever. But one of the most important things we can do is pray. So that's one of the things I want to encourage you to pray about today. Uh, if you have your phone or you keep a calendar, I want you to put a reminder in your Google calendar, in your Outlook calendar, to pray for the Martins every day. Just pray for them every day. Pray for them before you go to bed tonight. Pray for them in the morning to pray for them. And one of the things that I think is, is the best thing we can hold on to, because I don't even have the words to describe all, all I feel and sense when I think about that news, is Scripture. That's the one thing I love to run to when I'm just like, oh, Lord, how do we respond? And Romans 12, 14 says this. You weep with those who are weeping, and you rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And it's the same verse. Sometimes you do that simultaneously. And one of the reasons I'm rejoicing today is that Jake and Daphne are wonderful Christian parents. They did everything right and they introduced their son to the person of Jesus Christ. They got it right, did everything right. And their son, two years ago in this congregation on a Sunday morning, was baptized in response to his public profession of faith and belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, and so 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says we grieve for sure. But we don't grieve, and we're not sad like people who don't have hope. Today, church, it's good news. We know where Campbell is. And that's good news. I'm so grateful. Let me just say this real quick. For those of you that have ever served in our preschool and children's ministry, or you serve now, we are forever grateful for you. Thank you for the way that you serve and you try to come alongside parents and point the next generation to Christ. What happens on the back half of this room on Sunday mornings and all six days of the week, it matters, y'all. It matters. So I'm just so grateful that we grieve, but we rejoice for God's goodness. So I want to give you just a chance to make yourself comfortable. So if you want to bow your head and close your eyes, if that's helpful, um, if you're at home and you want to eliminate distractions any way that, that that feels best, then please do that. But I want to give you some time to pray on your own, okay, for this sweet, precious family. You pray that they would sense and feel the peace and the comfort of Jesus Christ. Jesus can do for them what you and I cannot, and that's what we're praying for. 
It's what we're grateful to be able to call upon him for. But you also pray for all of the friends and family and others affected by this. You pray as you feel led. And then I'll close our time of prayer together in just a moment. Lord Jesus, we come together as a people, as a family. That's what Avenue South was intended to be. That's what you wanted her to be. And so, Lord, I'm so grateful for family. I'm I'm grateful that we're in relationship with the Martins. I'm grateful that you give us the privilege to pray on their behalf right now. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would envelop them, would overwhelm them with your love and approval of them, and your peace and your comfort. Lord, dispatch angels to surround them and to minister to them the same way they did to you after you spent time in the wilderness. We pray for that for them. God, our hearts are also very grateful. We're grateful to see the next generation come to know you. And so we're grateful for the salvation that you made possible for everyone on the cross, but that Campbell heard and he responded. And we, if we lived a thousand years, it wouldn't be long enough to tell you how grateful we are that he knows you and he is with you now. We have great hope in that. And Lord, I pray for every woman, man, teenager, or child who does not know you that that would follow in those footsteps of Campbell, that he would be an example to all of us that the spiritual decisions we make in this life, they echo into the next. So God, we bring our, our thoughts, our emotions, and our lives before you in this moment, and we thank you that there's no one like Jesus. You're our hope, you're our joy, and you are the thing that is a solid foundation that we're building our lives upon. And for that, we say thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, hey, listen, church, I know that is a weighty but a worthy thing for us to do together. So we felt it would be appropriate to come out of that prayer time by singing praises to God that are undergirded, that are informed by Scripture. So Ronnie and the team are going to lead us in singing a song about the beautiful name of Jesus. That There's no power or no authority. There's no hope like him. God's promised to inhabit the praises of his people. So you sing and know that Jesus is in this place and let his Holy Spirit minister to you as you sing and as you listen to the music. Let's stand together as they lead us now.
we sing that song? Death. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no right. Well, I want to thank Ronnie, Larissa, and Rebecca, and obviously the whole worship team, just uh, reminding us how important it is to be part of a church family. And uh, I mentioned a moment ago that the first church in the book of Acts, they worshiped through a number of means and songs and prayers and the giving of their offerings. Uh, they also worshiped through the reading of Scripture. And so that's what we're going to do now. If you have a Bible with you or you follow along on your smartphone, let me encourage you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel simply means good news. There are four Gospel accounts in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke wrote to a congregation or an audience of listener who did not grow up in Judaism, didn't understand or at least didn't appreciate a lot of the religious movements and understandings of the Hebrew and the, the, the Israelite people. And so he's writing to people that didn't grow up in church. And so if you're here today and you're like, I, I'm just visiting or I'm watching online and I'm not really um, into the, the church or the things of God, like th this is such an encouraging letter because it's like, hey, we just want to share with you what, what this guy Jesus was all about and what was happening as he preached and teach and the way people's lives were changed. And what we want to do today is we want to continue in Luke chapter 12. We're going to read in verses 13 through 21 together as Jesus is teaching in a series of parables, and a parable is a story that illustrates a much greater important meaning or significance. Let me invite you, if you're in this room, to stand in honor of God's Word. If you're at home, we would invite you to do that in your apartment or dorm room as well. That's our way. We may not do it every Sunday, 
but that's our way of saying this word is authoritative. It, this has the ability to change our lives, and we're grateful that God is in this place. Luke tells us that someone from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, Jesus said to him, Who appointed me the judge or the arbitrator over you? He then told them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then Jesus went on to tell them this parable. A rich man's land was very productive. And he thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? Well, i tell you what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and I'll store all my grain and all my goods there. Verse 19, then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to this man, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you, and all the things you've prepared, well, whose will they now become? That's how it is with one who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Let's pray together, church. Lord Jesus, I believe even before we read this story, most of us are intuitively know that true, lasting joy, contentment, whatever it is we're after, it can't fully be acquired or secured in any amount of the things of this world. Whether that's finances, whether that's vocation or employment, whether that's relationships, these things are good. But Lord, our fleshly hearts pursue them as if they can do for us what only you can. Let us hear your words and have eyes to see what matters most so that we would enjoy this life, but we would find our contentment and our salvation in you alone. And we say and pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, almost 20 years ago when I started out in vocational ministry, I was a middle school minister. I absolutely loved working with middle school students because they could be so innocent and so sincere. They hadn't been jaded by the world yet. They could also be sarcastic and snarky and rude and hurtful to one another. But I I loved being a middle school minister. I can remember one particular week having studied the lesson. I don't even remember what the text was, but I remember studying the lesson and I I found such great pleasure being in ministry. I felt like what we do to teach the next generation, it matters, and I I studied. I can tell you I spent hours studying and thinking through the the open-ended questions I would ask about every 15 minutes throughout the lesson to get them to engage the text. And I can remember teaching and beginning the lesson on a Wednesday night, and I I asked that first open-ended question, and one of the boys said, I've got something to say, and I thought awesome. Like uh, Usually it's pulling teeth, but this is fantastic. What is it? And he said, I just think I should share with you that I ate a battery this week. (laughs) And I said, do you mind saying that one more time? He said, yeah, you know, like one of those Duracells, like I ate one of those this week. And I thought to myself, like, Jesus, where do we go from here? Like immediately, no one was focused on the text we had read until one of the other boys offered something helpful and said, you know those things have acid, right? And I thought, Lord, I don't think we're going to end up talking about Scripture this evening. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Now listen, as silly as that sounds, that's exactly what's going on in this text. This text is so relevant to us in 2021. If you didn't know what's happening in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, I want to encourage you to go back and read the text later this week, the whole chapter. And the verses that precede this interaction is this man engages Jesus, and Jesus tells this parable of a rich fool. Jesus had been teaching about the most important thing a person can do with their life. Jesus had been asked about sins, and he was talking about sins in the context of what can be forgiven and what can't. Sometimes as a pastor, I'm asked, are there some sins that God will not forgive? Are there unpardonable sins? 
Please hear me. The full complement of Scripture communicates that on this side of heaven, there's nothing you've done. There's no experience that you've gone through that the Lord cannot forgive and begin to restore and heal, if not fully in this life, definitely in the next. But when you leave this world and you stand before Jesus, the one thing that can't be undone, the one thing that can't be given a do-over is whether or not you know him. There's no waiting room in heaven. There's no purgatory. There's no like second chances. Like you either know him when you meet him or you don't. And the Bible says when you meet him and you know him, he says, you belong to me. And the inheritance that we experience is relationship with him, perfect flourishing relationship. And of course, he says, and all of this, a literal place called heaven, is your inheritance as well. But if you don't know him, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Which sounds a little harsh, but I love that about Jesus. Because right now, if you say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus, he is a respecter of persons. And he will not twist your arm, manipulate you, or force you, nor will this pastor, for you to follow the gospel, the good news of Jesus. That's kind of what Jesus is talking about. You can deny the Holy Spirit trying to bring you into salvation. That's that's the worst thing that could happen. Jesus is talking about some significant things. And this guy pipes in with his own battery acid comment. He says, hey, tell him to give me my money. I want you to think, as crazy and insane as that sounds, that's what he asks while Jesus is saying there are really important, significant things to talk about. And he says, excuse me, Rabbi, my brother owes me some money. Can can you settle that for us? Now, did you notice what Jesus said? You can almost see him like, are you kidding me? What did he call him in verse 14? I love Jesus. He's so kind even when we don't deserve it, right? Well, hello, friend. Right? That's what he says. Friend, he said to him, who appointed me judge or arbitrator over you? Now, listen, if this guy literally, this is a true story, this happened. So if this guy's like, I I need money that's owed me. Usually in a Jewish family, in a Jewish family, the oldest son received a double portion or more inheritance than the younger children, the younger son, like. This was a pretty big deal. So clearly he's saying, my older brother has money that's owed me, all right? And he asked him, what are you going to do about it? And Jesus says, dear friend, and then wraps the brick in velvet before he hits him in the eyes with it. Who appointed me judge or arbitrator over your family affairs? In other words, I didn't come to rule and lead the people's court. I'm not Judge Judy. That's not what I'm here for. I came, as Luke 19, chapter chapter 19, verse 10 says, I came to seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus is all about. Searching, pursuing, finding. That's the story of the cross. Jesus is pursuing people who are lost and separated from God. And through his finished work on the cross that would happen shortly after his public ministry, Jesus has made a way for us to be found, to be discovered, to be placed into a right relationship with God. He says, that's what I've come to do. Now listen, Jesus isn't against helping the guy. Like, listen, if this guy's been wronged, if you read scripture, Jesus is all about justice, right? A lot of people talk about justice. We We need to pursue justice. Very few Christians that talk about justice know what scripture says about justice. All throughout scripture, God's heart is to make right what's wrong. And one of the things I'm most looking forward to when Jesus returns is he will deal with everything that's wrong. And he will make everything right. Jesus is all about justice. It's not that Jesus doesn't want to help this guy if he's been wronged by his brother. But what Jesus is really realizing is this guy, this guy's real issue is not a passion for justice. This guy has a heart problem. Like he, this guy has a heart problem. And one of the things that happens is that the questions that we ask, the statements that we make, often reveal what's going on in our heart. Now, he said, help me. Like, can you tell my brother? But what he's saying basically is, can you tell my brother? He's asking a question. Sometimes the questions we ask reveal what's going on in our heart. Uh, I heard of a story recently uh, of a financial advisor. This is a true story here in Middle Tennessee, a financial advisor that when he sits down 
with people, new prospective clients to talk, when they want to invest, when they want to set up a will, when they want to do retirement, he pulls out a magnifying glass. Pulls out a magnifying glass. And, and, he, and he hovers over the paper, dollar signs and figures, and he says, you know what's interesting is dollars, resources, really amplify the things we can't see that are going on in your heart. And you, you follow the trail of where you spend your money, and it tells you what you care about, right? You and I follow the trail of what we spend our time on. It tells us what we really value, right? You follow the trail of where we spend our talents and abilities, and it tells us what's really important in our heart. And this guy's question reveals this guy has a problem with his heart. This guy's greedy. Like, he wants what he feels is due him. Like, he, Jesus is probably like, why don't you even feign, like, act like you care that your father's no longer with you? At least act like you agree with that instead of being like, hey, man, all this money available. Thanks, Dad. Like, I just want what's owed me. You know, like this is crazy. And this stuff happens in real life. It happens in 2021. And so Jesus realizes there's something, brother, there's something wrong with your heart. Money's not really what you're after. Because by the way, I love how Andy Stanley says it, a pastor in the Atlanta area. He says, your flesh, when you're born into this world, you are born with a sin nature, a flesh nature. And your flesh, my flesh, only knows one word, more, more right? It only knows more. Whatever it is you're after, whatever it is I'm after, like we perceive that we'll get that thing. And listen, it doesn't have to be about money. Like what dollar amount is enough, right? You talk to athletes, you talk to entertainers, they got a goal, they hit that and they're like, but maybe just a little bit more. Maybe just, it doesn't have to be about money. It could be about something else. What if we pursue relationships or we pursue marriages? That's the thing that will that's the treasure I'm after. And there's nothing wrong with that. Please hear me. Jesus talks more about money than he does just about everything else in Scripture, okay? He's not preaching against money. He's not, he doesn't have a problem with that. He's not preaching against relationships. I'm not either. I'm just simply saying whatever it is that we're after, if we're like, that's, what, that's what's most important. Jesus says, is it enough? When is it ever going to be enough? Because you're going to want something else. I know plenty of people that have said to me or said to others, just marriage is what it's all about. And they get married and they're like, is this it? Like, like maybe it's the job, maybe it's something else, maybe it's a pursuit, maybe it's a hobby. Your flesh only knows one word, it's more. This guy's looking for contentment, he's looking for satisfaction. So Jesus starts off with a proverb, if you will. Did you notice what he says here in verse 15? Jesus says, watch out. I love when I look around this room, and if you're at home and you got your journal or your pen out, I love seeing that. Because we need to feast on God's word. We need to let it be sewn into the fabric of our soul so it feeds us, it nourishes us, it convicts us. Jesus says, watch out, brother. And really what he's saying is, you need to see things for what they are. Brother, you, you need some spiritual eyes to see what matters most. Okay? And oftentimes... In Jesus' ministry, it's often referred to as the upside-down kingdom. The kingdom Jesus came to unleash is not a gospel, good news of prosperity and everything that we ask for. By the way, you can get everything you're after, and it can absolutely destroy you. One of the worst things that could happen is God could answer all of our prayers, and we could get everything we're after, and we don't have the character to sustain it. It could be the worst thing ever. Romans chapter 5 says that hardship and waiting and patience and perseverance, it, it, it produces character and character yields hope and hope never disappoints. What if God, in, in, in the moments that we're waiting, we're longing, we're like, what does God up to? What if he's shaping the character in us that he's actually going to answer some of our prayers, that he doesn't have a problem if we have a nice townhome or a nice house or nice vehicles or if we are married or if we have families or if we're able to reach the corporate goals that we have. What if he doesn't have a problem with any of that and it's all good because it's inherently neutral. It's not good or bad, but Jesus knows you're going to need the character to be able to sustain that when I bring it into your world. What if that's what he's doing right now, y'all? And we're like, come on, Jesus, I hate waiting. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's just me, but I don't say that in my prayer life, okay? But it feels that way. Waiting and being patient is not passive. It's active. It's looking for where God is at work. It's listening, spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to hear. And Jesus says, uh, let me, uh, this picture frame of the kingdom of God, because this is a Jewish guy. This is a Jewish guy, like you, um, 
you think it's all about what's in this world. Let me do this for you. And he takes the painting and, and turns it upside down. Um, that's, that's what I'm all about. It's not the stuff of the world. It's not about building bigger barns. It's not about the pursuit of that. He says what in verse 21? It, it's really about being rich in the things that matter. He tells this guy a very sobering parable. So he's having an, a, a real-life conversation with the guy, and then he tells a story to illustrate his point. And in the parable, he says, there was a guy who had tons, and he's out here building barns and bigger barns, and he's like, one day I'll get there, and I'll settle down, and I'll enjoy myself. And guess what? The guy finally arrives at that point, and God comes to him and says, you silly, silly man. You've done all this, and tonight your life's coming to a conclusion. You're not even going to have time to enjoy it. And guess what? I'm probably like this guy right here. There may be people squabbling over what you've left them. Is that really what it's all about? And Jesus tells this story. Now, it immediately made me think of our brother James. And I call him our brother. He's our brother. James in the New Testament, a follower of Jesus. In James chapter 4, verses 13 and 17, he says this to Christians. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know what your life will become or won't become. For your life is like a, ma a vapor or a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will do this or we will do that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting is evil. He says, guys, it's a sin to know the good that you should do and yet not do it. One of the sobering realities of this parable is Jesus is confronting us with the reality of what are we pursuing for contentment? What are we pursuing, pursuing for contentment? And that's really a question that we should ask ourselves. And by the way, when the guy says, then I'll say to myself, I don't know if you noticed that in verse 19, he said, I'll build bigger barns, I'll store my goods there, and then I'll say to myself, it's always dangerous. It should be a red flag to you when you're telling people what you think God is doing in your life as opposed to leading with, here's what God is doing in my life. Anytime Luke says in his gospel that someone, even in a parable, says, then I thought to myself, it's a warning sign. Are you looking for the things that you want in your life? Are you looking for the things that God wants to bring into your life? Because he says, you don't know if you'll live through the end of this day. Now listen, the old school preachers used to preach fire and brimstone at a moment like this. They, they, they'd hold you so close that you'd feel, oh, you'd lean back and the heat would be in the front rows. We recently had somebody that invited their boyfriend to church and they brought him up to the second row on day one. I'm like, yeah, man, right there where the heat is. Come on, just come on in. So it's kind of one of those moments, right, where it's like, there's a sobering reality here this. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Our church has been reminded of that this week. You have an opportunity right now, in the sound of my voice, proclaiming the word, to believe this and to respond. And I'm going to suggest to you that you not put that off or delay. Not, not, not because I say so, but our brother James and our Lord and Savior Jesus says, you should really, you should really, do something about that. Today is the day of salvation. Do not deny. Do not delay that. If you don't know Jesus Christ, it's the first thing I want to encourage and invite you to do, to follow Jesus and to invite him into your life. And let me tell you why. Because he can come in and he can, he can change the perspective on what you're pursuing. Now, remember what I said. He may, not, he, may, he may not. I think we're afraid that if we let him come into our lives, he's going to take all the fun away. <laughs> What if he literally wants to know, do you, do you really trust me? He may actually, like I said, give those things back to us, and now we can appreciate them. Now we can leverage and use those, not only to enjoy. God wants us to enjoy this. He wants us to enjoy creation. He wants us to enjoy relationships. He wants to enjoy a good meal together with friends. How many stories about Jesus around a meal table, right? And road trips throughout Galilee, right? That's the good stuff. But he wants us to know. But, but hey, guys, don't. Don't ever put your salvation in those things. I mean, Jesus even said himself, what good is it if you find salvation in the things of this world and you lose your life, which ultimately leads to death? But anybody who finds salvation in Jesus will find eternal life, and you'll be rich towards God. That's really where the good stuff is. Look at what it says in verse 21. If Jesus is confronting greed or a 
a problem in our hearts, the antidote, if you will, the antidote. You ever seen those spy movies where they're like, you just swallowed poison. You are not well. Here's the antidote. And they hold up a little vial. And they're like, the difference between life and death is right here. Verse 21, Jesus is saying, but here's the antidote. Here's the antidote to trying to find salvation and satisfaction of an eternal significance in this life. He says, be rich towards God. Be rich towards God. Now, listen. Listen. It's just a day for our brothers in the New Testament. I told you about James. Listen to what our brother Timothy says. He's a young pastor. I like pastors. Okay, let's, let's see what he has to say. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Instruct those who are rich in the present age. And by the way, if you're an American, you have more wealth than approximately 85 to 90% of the rest of the developed world. True story, statistically, Okay. Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us all with things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, and to store up treasures for themselves in heaven as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what is truly life. You know, when I read that and I thought about this text this week, I'm like, Lord, forgive me. I need to repent of ever trying to build bigger barns when I should just, instead of being out there trying to build bigger barns, we should just be content with the little piece of the kingdom we've got. We have all we need. You may not always get what you want as a Christian, but you and I will never go without what our Father knows we need because he loves to give good things to his children. It delights him to give us what we need to flourish in relationship with him and with each other. Those are things like peace. Those are things like joy. Those are things like contentment. You and I know people that have everything and they have no joy. They have no peace. They have no contentment. It's because it's found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So really... If we're going to be rich towards God in this life, what does that look like, right? Because with a parable, we should apply it in some way, right? So here's what I want to tell you. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Do you have a favorite verse? If somebody's like, what's your favorite verse? And you're like, oh, my gosh, I don't have one. Like, go ahead and use this one. Like, you, you can, you know, plagiarize it and, like, use it. It's cool. What? Don't tell anybody I told you. But Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything you have in your bank account, everything that you have in your driveway, everything that you have rented or leased or borrowed in your apartment, in your dorm room, it's not yours. It's not mine. View yourself as a steward, not an owner. View yourself. You're passing through this life. Hold those things loosely in your hand. That's a perspective thing. So that's a little harder to apply because that's general. That's general. View yourself as a steward. If you don't, pray this week, Lord. And, and most of us are like, we, we get this. We know this. But it's like, Lord, help me to have an eternal perspective that sees me as a steward instead of an owner. Help me be a good steward with this. That's, that's a little bit of a way to apply this. But secondly, one of the things I think about is when our brother Timothy said this right here. Instruct people to do what's good. Instruct them to give what they have to others. To give what they have to others. Don't be arrogant with the things that you have. If you have something, bless and serve others. Part with it. And, and listen, as you part with it, it loses its hold on your heart. You may lament. I wish I hadn't given that away. That's okay. You can say that selfishly to the Lord. Lord, I just, I kind of regret that. But it's okay. That's human. Like, as you do, it'll slowly remove the hold it has on your heart. Giving things away. Clear out your barns, people. Clear out the things that are in your heart that hold your heart. Be generous. My grandmother died in January of 2020, 90 plus years old. She died right before COVID turned our world upside down. My grandmother was a widow for some 20 years. She just wanted to go to heaven and be with Jesus and to see her husband again. And one of the things we found out shortly after she passed is the family started finding out all of these ministries and parachurch organizations that contacted the family to say, here's her contribution statement from 2019. Now, she's on a fixed income, right? You and I wouldn't look and say, 90-plus-year-old woman, fixed income, living in a maybe 20 by 18 room, maybe, with kitchen, little studio apartment, like, we wouldn't say in our 20s or our 30s or even our 40s, that, that, that's where I'm headed. 
But you know what? Some of these statements from these ministries in the Middle East said she gave $2.30 every month to support missionaries who are there reaching people who do not know Jesus. That may not seem significant, but it's what she had. Read the story of the widow's mite in the New Testament. It's fantastic. We'd get other letters. This is what she did in Central America to fund $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a year to fund the translation of Bibles so people in Spanish-speaking countries could discover who Jesus is and realize, I'll never have what Americans have, but I can have peace and joy that many of them don't have, and I want it in Jesus. And I'm just going to suggest, this is hypothetical here, but I'm just going to suggest when Dorothy met Jesus, and the first person you'll see when you slip into eternity is Jesus. I'm going to suggest that when she met Jesus, it mattered more how she had invested those treasures in advancing the gospel here than any mansion or car or road trip or concert or anything she could brag about to Jesus. Because the Bible says he loves to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And what if, hypothetically, my grandmother meets people from around the globe in heaven that she played just a small portion in providing a resource, a meal, a Bible, whatever, to advance the kingdom of God. I mean, like, is that not something to say, like, Lord, I want to be a part of something like that. Give me a heart that wants to be rich towards God, and I'll trust you with the outcome of that, right? That's why I'm so grateful for Matthew Page, our minister, missions minister. We prioritize every Sunday to, to be accountable to you, but to share with you where your giving goes. Yes, it's to the local church. Yes, it's to ministries that the Lord is advancing the gospel in our neighborhood and around the world. Be rich towards God. Clear out your barns if you need to. Prioritize your budget so that money is going to fund the advancement of the kingdom. And if nothing else, open up your mouth and invest the gospel verbally into the lives of others that can change the trajectory of their eternity. That's the antidote to greed. That's the good stuff. That's what Jesus came to give us eyes to see and hands that want to participate in. That's what's happening here with Jesus. Man, I want to be a part of a church like that. We have been a church like that. But as the Lord continues to entrust stuff to us, we have to present our hearts to him and say, do in my heart. Make my heart want what your heart wants. And that's one of the most important things for us in this moment. So let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. Ronnie and the worship team are going to be coming up to the platform, so there may be a little bit of movement in the room. But I want you to think about... What matters most to you in life? Do you know Jesus? Do you realize that when you meet Jesus, that will be the most important thing you've ever done with your life here on earth? And if you do not know Jesus, I plead with you. I challenge you. I invite you to trust Jesus, to say, Jesus, I want you as Savior in my life. Do that today because you're not promised tomorrow. And maybe you know Jesus, and you are aware that you've been richly blessed. And you want to give your resources to fund the advancement of people discovering him. Pray and ask Jesus for a generous heart. Say, Jesus, give me a heart that wants to be generous with my money, my time, my relationships. And then you need to spend some time this week. You need to journal. You need to stare at a blank wall. And you need to jot down and make some notes about what that looks like in your life. If you're not in a small group or a Bible reading group, that's where we discuss these things the other six days of the week. Put yourself in biblical community where you can flesh this out a little bit more than we can on Sunday morning. But I want you to do what you need to do in this moment. So let me give you about 120 seconds to pray and reflect. And then Ronnie and the team will ask us to stand and sing in response to how good God has been to us and that he simply asked us to be rich in return to his father.
Well, good morning, y'all. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Judson Shadowin. I'm a senior at Lipscomb University, and uh, I just want to come and talk to you guys a little bit about the college ministry we have here. Um, it has kind of been building up over the past couple of years with Hunter Melton leading, um, and, and this year we are starting um, small groups um, on Sunday nights. Um, here at the church at 6.30. So we'd love for the college students here to come and be a part of that. It's just focused on discipleship and um, learning how to grow closer to Jesus. So we, we have um, people from all across Nashville, college students. We have from Lipscomb, Trevecca, Belmont, Vanderbilt, Nashville Dance School, Nashville State. So if you're anywhere in the college range, um, eighth year seniors, maybe maybe not um, as much. Uh, there's a young, young professionals group for that. Um, but, um, you know, we really would love for you guys to come out because it, it is a great time and we love to uh, see each and every one of you. And, you know, if there's 100 people here tonight, that's going to be great. I don't think we can do that because of COVID. Um, so don't invite everybody that you know, but just, just one or two people. Um, but if you have five people here, you know, we're still going to, to love that and love on you and, and really just challenge each other, invite each other into a time of worship. Um, and, you know, we really love for you guys to be here. 6.30 tonight, there'll be coffee, decaf coffee, uh, maybe pizza rolls. You never know. Uh, we had one for the Super Bowl. So come out if you're hungry, but I would eat something before you come. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we really want you guys to come out no matter where you're from. We, um, I, I said this in the first service. Um, my, my parents and my grandparents went to Lipscomb. I have deep roots in Lipscomb. And if you don't know anything about Belmont and Lipscomb, there's a basketball game. And, and I used to hate Belmont, but the Lord is has redemptive qualities. He has redemption. And I love Belmont students. Billy, Billy Mahaffey, good friend. He's from Belmont. So the Lord can change your heart if you have any rivalries towards anybody in, in Nashville. So anyway, um, so we also have a, a hiking trip on March 6th. If you guys want to come out, it'll be in the area and we'll have a really good time. And um, so there is a group me that if you want to be added to, or if you're already in the college ministry, check that out. Um, and then I'll be down, down here after service. Hunter Melton is back in the lobby um, if you have any questions about that. But we love y'all. 
Um, I love each and every one of you and our college students especially. I can't wait for you guys to be here tonight um, and just every other night and just really plug into this community. So love you all. Appreciate it. Y'all have a great rest of your week and uh, we'll see you all here in just a second. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Hey, let's stand together. We'll sing these words. Well, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. And praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. We'll see you next week.